Welcome back to the Win With Dice podcast, a podcast featuring members of the Win With Dice team. I'm Calvin, and I'm joined here by Ramon. Hey, YouTube friends. If this is your first time listening to the Win With Dice podcast, well, thank you for joining. And um, if uh, this podcast is all about tabletop RPGs, uh, running them and playing them, and uh, Calvin and I like to take a casual approach to the hobby. And uh, so, you know, uh, we like to talk about the games that we run and the games that we play and all the cool wonderful people we get to do the hobby with and uh yeah uh this whole thing is just uh you know if you have never played tabletop rpgs then what are you doing you should be finding a table or convincing your friends bullying them even to play a game <laughs> and uh if you are you know fond enough to have a group uh or sorry a uh, fun <laughs> if you're lucky enough <laughs> yes yeah, so you're lucky enough uh to find, have a group uh then uh, yeah why don't you gm for uh, your table give the gm a break <laughs> it's fun it's easy and it's really rewarding Indeed. Uh, so this week, I wanted to get into a recap of a recent Pathfinder 2B game uh, that I ran. Well, not recent because it was some time ago. But it is a continuation in my Fate Seer series, kind of starting the second arc of that campaign, uh, getting into all the new problems the players have to deal with uh, now that they know a bit more about what they are up against. And in addition, also had to add a new player to that group so we can get into the whole fun of that and this new character that I am really enjoying and excited to have in my party. Nice. Uh, but before we get into all that fun stuff, we have to get to the most important part of the show, the Win With Dice Weekly GM Tip of the Week. Yes, the Win With Dice Weekly GM Tip of the Week, brought to you by Calvin and a little bit of myself. <laughs> Hello. So something that's been on my mind lately because I've been doing some uh, campaign planning is just how much impact scale can have on your campaign when it comes to like the physical space of where you think your campaign will take place, whether it'll be something where you're traveling to different locations or throughout an entire plane or even just like in a single neighborhood or in a single city or a single town and the region around it. It really sort of affects the kind of stories um, that you're able to tell. It gives you sort of new and different options and new and different characters that you can use as well because you might be a bit more likely to have certain characters pop up every now and then if you're in like a it's more of a single location but at the same time if you're traveling um you get to have all sorts of different flavors and ideas that come up and you get to sort of mix things up in different ways depending on how large or how small you want your campaign to be yeah yeah i think it's also like the stakes too right and like the personal relation that like the characters have to whatever you're the bad guy or like the the conflict or whatever you're trying to do right mm -hmm. I, obviously uh epic scale is really fun you get to save the whole world the plane whatever you become gods or you know defeat kaijus or whatever that's starting the thing but it's also like something to say about running a story where you're just trying to help out like the local bakery or like bust a gang because you know you're trying to make your streets safe or something like that right, right. um yeah and like obviously in campaigns uh, most i would say most if you buy a campaign off of the bookshelf, like a or like the Adventure Path series, you always start off super small and get super big, because um, you know that's how the power growth goes. But so something to be said to just kind of like maybe running like a few levels uh, or like just have like a an adventure or something in a few levels in something small, or even just do like you guys are already established heroes. Here's something big, right, to deal with instead of just like doing the progression. Yeah, yeah. Like even like again, playing with different power levels as well gives you a whole bunch of different things you can learn and deal with and just different challenges you can throw at the party yeah yeah so yeah there you go folks there's your tip of the week uh think about the scale that you want to have your conflicts at and uh you know you could just jump right ahead and just do that or you can do the whole progression or you can just you know skip to the end and be like go, i'm gonna go uppercut thor or something because <laughs> i don't like that guy <laughs> yeah man <laughs> which is a good idea to do <laughs> yeah all right, let's get into this Pathfinder 2E recap of the quest of the Fate Seer. Uh, now, previously, when we last left off with that group, um, we did have a new player in playing a guest character who was helping the party out with an infiltration. Uh, the party had been tasked with delivering a young gnome girl named Rima to this priest or this uh, paladin or champion of Saren Ray uh, by the name of Fandrovo. Uh, the party being Solo, a human bard, and Dolorfek, a dwarf fighter. And they were previously joined by Izzy, a rogue half-elf, with 
Izzy's help, they were able to break into Fandrobo's place uh, because once they had successfully gotten to Fandrobo, they found out that Fandrobo had some other uh, secondary motives that she was being very, uh, very hidden about. It turned out mm. that Brima, this young gnome girl, actually had connections to a powerful demonic entity that was nearly summoned into the material plane. And Fandrovo believed that the only way to keep all of reality safe was to keep Rima contained within a cold iron cage. Uh, the party was able to rescue her and in the process discovered that Fandrovo seemed to have the power to stop time, uh, at least for a brief period. But they were <laughs> able to make their escape. <laughs> I just remembered something. Sorry, Calvin. Fandrover's ability is very, very similar to a, an ability in an anime called Fire Force, where one guy, what he does is he slows the expansion of the universe to actually just stop time, which is kind of wild. Anime abilities are crazy. But I was like, oh, wait a minute. <laughs> I, just, I was just like, wait a minute. I've heard this before. Where did I have heard where some dude stops time? And I was like, oh yeah, there. <laughs> anyway. I mean, that's fair. But it is me, so of course it is a JoJo's reference. <laughs> As all yes, things of course. Must be. <laughs> that's also... Uh, I think that reference... Wait, I think Fire Force did take that from JoJo's because JoJo's obviously is the root of all anime. Uh, <laughs> that sounds true. <laughs> Okay, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> so they did make their escape, um, and we just had a bit of a time skip. Um, and the time on that fluctuated a bit because it was just a, like a matter of you guys have enough time to get somewhere and settle down for a bit. Um, so it was a few days later. They were in a new city uh, by the name of Towergate, uh, and this is a city that's near the coast, the northern coast of Tovaros, which is my homebrew world. Um, it is sort of the last stop between the mainland and the spire. And the spire is this massive tower, this massive, very thin, almost needle-like tower that stretches up into the sky and contains uh, just heaps and bounds of divine magical knowledge, uh, supposedly constructed by the gods, yada yada, that sort of thing. Magical tower. <laughs> I love you're just like, yeah, there's cool stuff in there. Don't ask me what's in there. It's <laughs> highly top secret. <laughs> it's whatever the party needs at the moment. Uh, <laughs> but they were hanging out in this city. Um, their general plan was just, you know, not staying in one place too long, trying to get new equipment, and then trying to figure out how to help Brima. Because essentially what Fandrovo's plan was is just keep her contained forever. Um, and largely only doing that because her friend Harkum asked her to, Harkum being the guy who pretty much raised Brima after he and Ventrobo found her. Mm. So they were trying to figure out how to deal with this intent, like this powerful demonic curse that's over Brima and trying to stay out of Ventrobo's clutches. Um, and again, just trying to lay low. So for the moment, they were just doing some shopping uh, stocking up on gear and things like that. Uh, Solo was the one who was hanging out with Brima, with Solo disguising himself as like a taller, misshapen gnome. <laughs> just like a really tall gnome. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So it's just like a short, really oddly looking person. <laughs> yeah, like short. He, no, Solo is like, in general, short for a human, but very tall for a gnome. Right, okay. Nice. Um, and Delorific had split off to do his own shopping. Um, he did get briefly spotted by the guards, but he was able to just, you know, escape from them uh, using some, just a quick chase sequence, uh, mm -hmm. which I think was just basically a compared athletics check. Makes sense. And then they did some shopping. Uh, Delorific planned to acquire a new weapon, so they would have to be in town for a few days. And in the middle of all this shopping, they were uh, additionally noticed um, after the uh, after the town guard got stuck trying to climb over a fence trying to follow Delorific. They were noticed by a mysterious figure by the name of Nell, uh, and this is the new character from the new player that has Ooh. joined the campaign. 
and Nell was just watching them for a bit, noted the direction the party was going in, uh, seemed to be aware of what tavern the party would be resting at for the time, and then just made their way to get there before the rest of the party did. So when the party showed up at the Swimming Goat Tavern, um, Nell was there waiting. Um, and Nell is just wearing like, uh, I think probably the most distinguishing thing about Nell is he has like these very, these eye covering glasses that have like very dark glass, basically sunglasses, um, where you're not able to see his eyes with the circular frames. Um, so mm. yeah, he is very mysterious. <laughs> Interesting. But he's sitting there waiting for the party to arrive. Um, and as they do, when they get a room, uh, Nell casts a message to Solo, whose disguise he was able to see through, saying that they need to talk, but Solo and the rest of them can decide the time and place. And in the meantime, during that conversation, like, Delorfec noticed that Solo just kind of zoned out a bit, because Solo was having like, a <laughs> mental conversation. <laughs> He was like, oi! <laughs> <laughs> but, um, yeah, eventually Nell was able to make their way over to the table where the party was waiting, asking if the empty seat was taken, and commenting that the party was a bit easier to find than expected. And Delorfic was like, oh no, it's the fuzz. <laughs> <laughs> we better cheese it. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but Nell said that, uh, no, it's quite the opposite. Um, and they wanted to have a private conversation. So, uh, there was quite a bit of mistrust between all of them, obviously. Uh, Solo was particularly off-put by Nell's glasses. Um, <laughs> Dolorvik was complaining that Solo always has people asking to get into Solo's room. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, yeah, Nell led the way up to a room um, where Solo noticed that um, there was a violin case in there already, but didn't say anything specific about it. Just, you know, one musician noticing another, it would seem. Mm. And then, yeah, Nell at this point introduced himself, basically saying that there are people who are watching the party um, and that the party deserves to know why that is. Um, Solo questioned if it was because he's cute. <laughs> Damn it. <laughs> <laughs> but basically what Nell started to say, and this is, I mean, I might say, I might have to tell the other players to skip a certain part if I want to get into more details about this. Because there's a lot going on here. Um, but essentially Nell was saying that there is another person who was interested in the party's activities and wanted Nell to spy on them. And Nell is putting this information out there because Nell is saying that they can sort of work both ways. They don't necessarily have to be entirely truthful to their employer. And in fact, oh, it seems okay. like they don't necessarily want to be. Right, right. So she's like kind of saying like, hey, I can be maybe uh, a double agent maybe we can i can give them some information that's false or incorrect and you know and also report like what their employer is up to yeah okay and yeah so they were just that was, that was basically the agreement they were starting to come to um solo and delorific were both a bit uncertain about trusting this person for obvious reason um although nell did say to brima uh and this was i think very interesting just a comment of like just it's like just made a comment about like knowing a bit about Brima's existence, obviously not full details, but knowing something of it, and just saying that uh, there's no judgment because we don't get to decide how we're made. And uh, it was just one of those things that I thought was really cool for a player to say. Ooh, I like that. I like it's just like say the cool one liner. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, dude walks in, has dark glasses a dark backstory a dark <laughs> secret organization okay <laughs> he's like don't worry i'll lie to my boss for you you don't fall in love with that guy i don't know man <laughs> right <laughs> so with Nell, um I, like again we have a new player um they're very excited and <laughs> this is a character that they've been wanting to play for a while um 
and you know had the characters statted up or at least concept concepted up in 5e so mm. it took a bit of work to get a conversion over um there was some custom stuff that i kind of want to do but they're not high enough level where i want to give them that power just yet okay. um but it, it's just because some, bringing something over from a bard ability in 5e that doesn't have a one-to-one -one comparison in pathfinder but i think yeah. it's doable Ooh, well it sounds like you got we got two bards going <laughs> true <laughs> Well, that's the thing. Nell is more of a rogue that's good at instruments. Ah, I see. He's more of like, uh, this is my hobby, not my job. <laughs> <laughs> Something like that. Um, yeah, he does have pretty good defor per uh, performance um, and some magic abilities. It's basically like, I mean, I don't want to say too much because I, I don't know if the, other, if the rest of the party's ca caught on, but it's like some roguing and some barding. I see. Okay, cool. I mean, I, I'm sure they'll find out um, as they adventure together. I'm assuming <laughs> that they got together. They didn't just be like, all right, bye. <laughs> bye. No. Um, although Dolorfec did wonder what Nell was going to get out of this, and Nell says that they just get to do some good, which is something that seemed pretty important. Um, but also, more importantly, or equally importantly, Nell said that uh, they know where some members of the cult of Gorziniath are. And that is one of the two major entities that the party is dealing with. Well, we have to deal with Fandrovo um, and any like other members of the Seren Ray Church who might be told to pursue them. They're also dealing with the cult of the demon that was originally meant to be summoned at Rima's birth. Um, ah. So now I'll kind of just can point them in a direction and at this point, Delorfe Delorfe and Solo were sort of on the fence a bit, but they did look to Brima to see what she would be comfortable with. And Brima sort of almost coldly and quietly just says that she wants to get rid of that entire cult. And Delorfe I was going to say, yeah, because then if the people who want to use Brima to, you know, as a portal are all gone, then maybe Fandrova can chill out, man. <laughs> like, Yeah, maybe. <laughs> Um, there's, there's probably a possibility, I mean, there's certainly a possibility the campaign ends with Vandrovo chilling out, if certain circumstances are met. <laughs> yeah. Okay, cool. Um, I mean, that's, that makes me feel better as, uh, a, like, partially just kind of watching this, this unfold, you know? So, <laughs> I like all these characters, and I don't want Vandrovo to just murder everybody, so it would be nice if... They didn't. Same. She didn't. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, same. Because I, <laughs> despite her everything, I also kind of like Fandrovo. <laughs> Me too. I mean, I like a good bad guy. You know, someone who's so good that they're 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 like I can't see any other way but to commit child murder <laughs> to save the world. And you're like, oh man, if you were just like a little bit. You just thought about it for like a second. <laughs> just get out of your righteous brain. It would be a lot better. But now nah, you're just actually too good of a person to be like, nah, man, that's one person versus everybody else. I got to do my job. Yep. No one else can do this. It all has to be me. <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, man, I love intro, though. But yeah. <laughs> um, so, yeah, they did come to an agreement that they would work together for a time. Um, Delorfec... <laughs> Uh, did specifically say, if you betray us, I'll kill you. And then Nell, resp oh, Nell responded with, I imagine you'll try. And then Delorific responded with, I imagine I'll succeed. Which, uh... <laughs> nice. <laughs> I love the sparks. That's so, that was pretty hot, man. <laughs> um, but yeah, um, so they still had a few days to wait for Delorific's weapon to be ready. Uh, so in that time, we covered some basic stuff, which just like securing transport to the next location they had to go to. Uh, yeah. But I did also have them do, and I, I kind of wish I had used the research subsystem for this, but it's fine. Um, I just had them do some skills checks to do some research. They were in a place where they basically have access to a library if they need it or other information. So they could start doing um, research on all the things they wanted to know, like what's the deal with demons? Uh, what's the deal with Gorziniath, the cult, and everything like that? 
and yeah, I just had them roll some checks, and just based on the results of those checks, um, I would let them know, like, certain information. Um, and there were some things they weren't able to find out that maybe they could try again later, but that's just what people were up to. Um, Nell was looking into how to permanently defeat a demon. Um, so far, all the research that was put together was only able to say that a demon could be shunted back into their plane after having like their incorporeal, or not, not necessarily incorporeal, I just can't think of the right word at the moment. But if a demon shows up on the material plane and they're defeated, um, i.e. reduced to zero HP, uh, they'll be put back onto their original hell plane that they came from. Um, but not necessarily able to find out how to permanently destroy one, or at least not yet. Yeah, yeah. Ah, uh, I mean, that would be pretty cool. That would be like a serious kill, you know, two birds with one stone. If there's no demon to be afraid of, then Fanjova definitely has to chill out, right? Like, yeah. <laughs> true. <laughs> so that, um, Remo's also researching something similar. Um, but she just confirmed that like an extra planar entity in the material plane needs an anchor to be there to like be at full power instead of what is essentially a projection, uh, yeah. which is why they get sent back to their regular plane, which is probably not how things work in Pathfinder canon, but that's how I've been doing it. So that's how it is. Yeah, I don't know. I feel like my demons function, like I always think that demons function like Warhammer demons where they just show up and then you beat them and then they just go on cooldown. <laughs> like they're like they're like stuck in the the warp or hell until like there's like you know a timer goes off and then they could just come back. Uh <laughs> yeah. most of the big big demons are like sent away for like years. It's like, damn it, I have to wait another ten years before I clap those cheeks again. <laughs> like <laughs> Yeah, man. Like it's a it's a it's a frustrating but short period of time for them, but then they come back and it's like a century later. <laughs> You're like, damn it! He's, my nemesis is dead. <laughs> I shall. I'm gonna go beat up his, beat up his his like granddaughter or something. <laughs> his great great granddaughter. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, there's there's, yeah, there's a good like, backstory for a player character. Yeah, it's like the Belmonts. You just have to keep fighting vampires every generation. Just, damn it! <laughs> just they keep pulling those damn Belmonts back in. <laughs> Uh, yeah. Uh, further, yeah, they were doing some further research. Uh, Brima was helping Delorfec, like, research how to remove that sort of extra planar anchor. Um, they weren't able to find anything, but it did seem like this might have been part of what Harkum and Fendrova were looking into as well. Oh, cool. Um, during their research, they were looking into, like, the specific names of demons that they know, which is, so far is Gornil uh, Gorziniath and Zarnilla, the succubus that had possessed Solo for a while, um, which Nell had asked about, and then Solo just said that they broke up a while ago. <laughs> they broke up a while ago. Um, and yeah, the last little bit of their research, um, they, re they looked into the cult a bit, so it might be easier for them to find some of the familiar symbols of them. Um, but one thing they did find was the name of Lamashtu, the mother of monsters. And that was like specifically mentioned in Harkum's note to Fandrovo and to Brima when he was talking about like Brima's origins. What? <laughs> Lamashtu? Oh, that's, that's a weird one, man. I just mm. threw it out there. Interesting. Uh, I mean, she mm. might have her own motivations that, I mean, I don't know. <laughs> I don't want to spoil too much. All right, let's. We'll find out later, folks. Lis listeners, we'll we'll press Calvin for for more information later. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, at that point, um, that was like the, or largely the research they were able to do over the course of those four days. Um, additionally, over those four days, Nell was playing the violin a handful of times. Um, also. Uh, asked if he could use the kitchen, but wasn't able to convince the uh, tavern staff to let him do that. It would have been very <laughs> fun, though. <laughs> oh, okay. And then at that point, yeah, they just start traveling. Um, so they know that the Gorziniev cult is going to be in Sinashari, which is a town not too far from where they were, uh, but its main sort of 
draw or its main... I don't want to say attraction, but the main point of this town is that it has a observatory that can be used for looking not only at the stars, but through sort of extra planar veils. Oh. Um, it's also... Wait, is, yep. Is that the same place? Is it Kai, Kyle... Yes. yes. <laughs> that is the same place that Koyel wanted to go to. Koyel, sorry. I was like, Koyel? Kyle? Yeah. <laughs> it's been a minute, so... It's been a minute since she came up in general, but yeah, that is where... Because that's basically where Koyel wanted to go, and she went with Baruth because it was basically in the same direction as the fighting tournament that Baruth was going to. Mm -hmm. Um. So yeah, they, there was just some brief stuff over the travel on the first day. Like again, I, I, I like to roll, you know, events and stuff, even if it's just some minor. You see a cool thing. Um. So they did see a cool tree arch that sort of went over over the path. Um. On the first day of travel. Um, but Solo and Nell struck up a conversation about playing music, um, and then when they set up to camp that night, they played like a duet song together with Solo sort of using his uh, composer staff that he picked up a while ago. And Nell was playing like this hauntingly beautiful song as the moonlight was falling over everybody, and then felt a sudden and familiar sensation in their hands and just kind of had to bring the song to a sudden stop. For reasons. Ooh, for, 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 for hot, dark reasons I can't explain. Yeah. <laughs> that is completely accurate. <laughs> I love it. Um, the next day, the thing that happened was that they ended up, as they were traveling, um, they were going off, um, because the, because Sinashari's basically upwards near a mountain ledge um they were traveling on more of a rocky path um and as they kept going the rocks themselves started to move and they started to follow the carriage and then they started to group together uh followed by larger and larger ones and then suddenly the party was ambushed by a living landslide what <laughs> shit so yeah, they were able to fend it off, even though it hurt Nell pretty badly. Uh, Dolorific was able to just smash the thing down. And um, later that night they set camp, and then the next day they arrived in Sinashari, uh, which is like, this, it's a fairly small town itself, but it is all sort of like centralized towards this observatory. While there, they were able to spot some of these gnome cultists uh, because I don't know if I've mentioned, but the cult of Gorziniath is pretty much entirely gnomish. <laughs> Just a bunch of little guys. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but she will know. They did try to follow the gnomes that they spotted, uh, but unfortunately they couldn't sneak up on them. They just got caught. Um, Nell was able to try and play it off. Uh, that, that they were like going into a, like, a nearby shop. Uh, and the first one they pointed to was, like, this horse saddle store. <laughs> <laughs> um, but at this point, the cult was feeling antsy, and then when they saw Solo as well, they pretty much just moved towards the observatory with more speed. Um, the party followed them, but gave them a bit of space to try and let the tension die down, so, you know, their enemies wouldn't be, like, right there waiting for them. Um, right. And it gave them some time to like get in disguises and figure out how to approach. So essentially what their plan was, was to send Dolorfek and Nell towards like the rear entrance of the observatory, while Solo and Brima would disguise as cultists, which Brima was debatable, was uh, not super happy with, but she was willing to do it for the team. Um, but they would disguise themselves and then head towards the front door. Um, and when they got there, they saw that at the moment there was only one guy outside. And between Solo and Brima, they were able to convince that guy that they were in the cult. But unfortunately, uh, the team at the other side did make some noise. So that guy was heading around and he was bringing what he thought was backup with him. Uh, so <laughs> nice. <laughs> so he basically, like, he gets there, he sees Delorvec and Nell, and he turns to Solo and Brima, and he's like, get them! <laughs> and you're like, joke's on you. <laughs> <laughs> and 
and it was like you like this guy was like desperately trying to like convince solo and Brie, but they're like go in it you have to go fight these guys and so it was like well i i don't know i don't think we have to do that and they were arguing back and forth <laughs> Uh, but they were able to get the drop on the guy. Um, they tried to interrogate him, Delorfic. Like, because they were near, like, a ledge, uh, Delorfic was using the height to, like, threaten the guys. They were sort of try trying to figure out, like, what are they doing here? What do you guys want here? Obviously, the guy didn't give an answer. Mm -hmm. uh, he just said, you know, normal culty things. We, we will destroy your world, burn the world down, that sort of thing. Right. Uh, so he ended up just getting dropped off the edge of this cliff. Oh no! Yeah. Shit. That's that's uh that's straight straight violence. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Guess it's fair. He's a bad cultist, man. Yeah. Um, like specifically Brima, she didn't really have much of a reaction to that sort of thing, which she might have had before. Oh man, this little thug just growing up hard on the streets <laughs> didn't even flick an eye. <laughs> it's a bit of that. She had to do a lot of growing up in the past few weeks. Oh um, no, Brima. <laughs> but like, especially when it comes to this cult in particular, she is. Uh, yeah. She 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 doesn't have any any uh, any issues with dropping one of them off a ledge. That's fair. That's fair. So after this, they went into the actual observatory itself um and there they noticed that there were a couple of cultist guys uh one of them a more buff looking bruiser type uh the other one a similar to what they had seen before it looks like more of a powerful spellcaster and it seemed like that guy had summoned some sort of small demonic creature and that creature was currently menacing a hostage inside of the observatory a very familiar looking tiefling. Oh. So. No. <laughs> <laughs> it seemed that Koyel did manage to make it to the observatory, uh, but now she had this demonic dretch like closing in on her. Uh, but of course, the party rushed into action, um, helping Koyel to escape, and then Dolorfek basically took out the dretch in one turn. <laughs> nice. Uh, but they were moving, they were working together. Um, Nell was also doing some... Again, because Nell has roguish stuff, so Nell just moves into like positions like flank or just knock the enemy flat-footed and then is able to get some extra damage in there from that sneak attack. Um, so that, yeah, the, like, it's... <laughs> to, make a, to make a combat short, the party was working very well together, um, kind of right off the bat. Nice. So they were able to deal with the cultists until just the spellcaster was left. Um, and they chose to knock him out because they wanted to do some interrogating. Um, but as they were sort of looting the enemies, um, when they got closer to this guy, they could see he was sort of moving strangely. Um, and it was actually something familiar to Delorfek and Solo because they had seen this before. Um, and they were able to sort of be on guard as a Vermlek burst out of the center of this guy. And again, like this worm demon just kind of like burst through the, the top of this guy, just like smashing through his head and neck area. And then the body itself just like puppeted it back up and started attacking everyone. Oh, uh, yeah. Again, getting some inspiration from Dead Space, eh? <laughs> <laughs> before. Now that I realize it, I think that thing showed up like when you were playing Dead Space the first, like the yeah. first Dead Space. <laughs> yes. <And> you're like <laughs> a little bit. <laughs> oh man! But they were they were able to take care of it, um, and then Koyel came back in, and realized that there was a whole lot of damage to the observatory and a big well. Some damage and a pretty big mess. Yeah. Um, and then she was like, do you guys want to just go get a drink? <laughs> I don't want to deal with this right now. <laughs> so, yeah, before they went to get that drink, um, they asked Koyel, like, what she thought the cultists were up to, like, if, she, if they said anything. Um, and she pointed out that they were trying to take apart the telescope that's part of the observatory. Because again, it's able to look sort of through planar veils because it has a metal called Abyssium inside of it. And that was what the cultists were looking for. 
Oh, okay. Like the metal itself? Yeah. Oh, strange. Uh, she explained that abyssium has sort of detrimental effects on people if they're exposed to it for too long. So it's got to be like in a lead lined, like it's in, it's like it's in, in its own lead shielding basically. Right. Um, but with the power of abyssium, they are able to sort of peer through planar walls. Um, but what the cult wants it for, uh, she could not say. But it is new information that the party has and could perhaps pursue. Nice. Okay, cool. So, yeah, there was a, a handshake with Nell after a job well done, and the party is off to get drinks with Koyel. And that is where we wrapped things up for the moment. Ah, nice. Well, I'm glad that Koyel made it. <laughs> 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 yeah, me too. Um, I didn't, unlike some other NPCs, I did not level Koyel up because it's not like she's been in combat or anything. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was pretty dangerous for her in that room. She's like, I'm a scientist, man. <laughs> 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 Trying to do science stuff. But yeah, I'm, I'm glad she's okay. Um, yeah, and I'm glad everybody is having fun and that the new character has slipped in pretty well. And that there's a whole bunch of mysteries going on, uh, especially with regards to that new character uh, that perhaps one day will be revealed. Yeah, and all of his hot, dark secrets. <laughs> <laughs> they truly are. Um, his, his tragic backstory where he's too dark and too hot to tell anyone. <laughs> Possibly. <laughs> <laughs> I hope the player's not listening. I'm not being. Uh, I actually truly love it when characters just get really can't feel like that. <laughs> so, yeah, definitely no offense, meaning just actually lots of love. And I hope that this character gets to continue to be dark and secretive more. <laughs> I'm really quite enjoying that character so much. Um, but, Ramon, there is one thing we have to take care of um, because your character Baruth went away some time ago to do take part in a fighting tournament um, yeah. <laughs> and he went there with Koyel and I don't know how well he did because I wanted to uh, let you have some impact on deciding that sounds good chief all right so uh, I, I, yeah let's do it what I wanted to do is I, I will have you just make a single die roll for uh, for Baruth. And we'll just use his athletic skill, just because that's like his highest skill, pretty much. Depending on the result of your roll, that will be basically how well Dolorefic did in that tournament. We're going to assume he qualified. Um, and then there would have been like basically three fights he would have to take part in, uh, depending on how well you do in this roll. So that they would okay. be like, you know, like the semifinal and a final and quarterfinal, whichever whichever order those are meant to be in. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah. So I don't know if you have a D20 in front of you, if you just want to roll one digitally, but a D20 plus 11. Okay. All right. Let's roll. So, um, okay. Let's roll a D20. Ooh, that's no bueno. Okay, so I got an eight plus eleven is seven. Oh, sorry, nineteen. Nineteen. Okay. Um, I mean, I don't know if you would have a hero point or anything. Do you? <laughs> do, you <laughs> do you think there is any um, advantage Baruth might have outside of normal circumstances going into this fight that he could possibly use for a hero point? It's to re-roll is that. Ko is Koyel there? For sure. <laughs> All right, then, yeah, my super new hot girlfriend uh, will <laughs> empower me. <laughs> I feel Ruth falters a second and looks up and sees his super hot girlfriend. He's like, oh, man, I can't choke right now. <laughs> we can roll. All right, I, I will, I'll allow it. You can roll the d20 again and take whichever result is higher. Oh, okay, cool. I got a 15, um, so plus 11, so that is 26. Okay. So in this tournament... Um, it features fighters from all across Tovaros um, and many different styles. Um, they can bring in weapons with them. They just have to be dulled or blunted um, and obviously not poisoned. Um, basically no lethal force, but they can still use their weapons as yeah. desired. So Baruth has 
gone through the qualifiers and he's into the tournament proper. Uh, his first opponent is a dwarf by the name of Lotril Brewmantle, who has this very new looking Warhammer, uh, which Ooh. he is striking with surprising, surprising strength with. Um, and it is a bit of a challenge at first, but Bruth, being this seasoned fighter and a monk, he's able to pick up on the fact that uh, Lotril has some old injuries he's dealing with. Um, seems like Lotril might have been in some sort of dangerous situation some time ago and hasn't fully recovered from it. Um, nice. Oh, I can let you describe this if you want. Like, so how would uh, Bruth take advantage of that? Well, I imagine like he's like, you know, bringing the hammer like, up and down just smashing and Bruth is trying to dodge out the way and then like uh since we uh you know had said Bruth was kind of struggling at the beginning and then saw Coil I like, imagine that Bruth is like at the edge of like the the fighting arena or whatever and uh is uh holding on to the hammer um while uh sorry what's the the dwarf's name again uh Lotril Lotril is like push like trying to like push the hammer down and like push him off so he can get a ring out and Bruce just notices like he's just leaning over and he's like looks at his girlfriend he's like oh no I can't choke now <laughs> and just kind of like heaves the dwarf up while the dwarf is holding the hammer and just kind of throws him behind him and does a ring out instead nice. of just beating him up <laughs> and Lotril is out of there rolling to the ground his hammer clattering down beside him um the next fight that Baruth would have to deal with is Fayola, who is a half-elf with a lighter and more agile fighting style. Um, she has these dull daggers that she use. Um, even though they're dulled, they still hurt a hell of a lot when she uses them. Um, <laughs> but her flaw is that she gets really overconfident with time. Uh, so uh, how, how would Baruth use that to his advantage? Ooh, okay. Wait, she she gets too overconfident. Like every time she lands in a section, she's like, "Ha!" <laughs> Pretty much, yeah. Uh, I think Bruth will just probably use. I think Bruth has a pretty substantial Constitution score, right? I think yeah. he probably has pretty high health. Yeah, so he probably just like would sit there and kind of tank all the hits, kind of just letting her uh, and looking for an opening, kind of similar to um, the the last fight. Indeed. And you do get that opening when she's just sort of like overcommits to a blow, expecting you to be in one place. And then just unexpectedly, you're not like Garuth is just not where she is trying to hit. And that leaves her wide open for a blow that she just she cannot take the same amount of damage that Baruth can. Yeah. And yeah. that blows enough to like sort of knock her off balance. Definitely give her the gut check, wombo combo, three keys, <laughs> <and> just. <laughs> And then toss her out the rink. Yeah. Uh. <laughs> yeah, she was getting by pretty well of just not getting hit, but then once those blows started landing, Fayola is down. And then we move on to the finals. And at this point, Baruth is faced with another half orc, but this one even larger than he is. Um, oh no. <laughs> <laughs> oh no. <laughs> Quite a bit tenser, it would seem. You've been keeping an eye on this guy ever since you got here in Gandoline, where the tournament is being held. This is Renkond. Um, and actually very similar to Baruth. He is able to take a lot of hits and keep going. And that's sort of been his strategy through the rest of the tournament, is just letting the opponent exhaust themselves. And then once they're unable to fight him off, that's when he hits back. Uh, however, Baruth has picked up on some vulnerabilities uh, within this half orc. Um, so mm. how would how would Baruth try to take advantage of this guy? He, you know that he can take a lot of punishment um, and then just, like waits for that opportunity to strike back. But how would how would Baruth take advantage of this guy? Well, okay. I mean, are we are we like is he like respectful? Like is he like oh you look like a good opponent? Are we, are we like? kind of like you know enemies but frenemies <laughs> like, i think things could like, go that way yeah like like game respects game like i just imagine just like i'm bruce built like a pillarman so like i mean like i feel like all half works in your world is now built like pillarman. <laughs> 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 
we in both, this fighting tournament. Show, yes. <laughs> yeah, we both show up and then we just all we just strike the pose. <laughs> uh, I see. <laughs> A worthy opponent. <laughs> yeah, pretty, pretty much that. <laughs> I feel like it would just go down to just being like a wrestling contest. Like we're both just like really ripped and sweaty, just like manhandling each other. <laughs> In like the most homoerotic way. Like that's, <laughs> that's, that's how I imagine it going down. It's like everybody's getting real steamy from all these hot half work men. Because apparently no one plays ugly half works ever in our never. Pathfinder games. They're always just like the most himbo looking motherfuckers. <laughs> of course they are. Yeah. Um, so the battle does go on for some time, but it comes down to that wrestling match. And Rencon, having been used to like being able to apply strength to overpower a foe, he realizes that in this moment, his endurance isn't enough to keep up with Baruth. And it takes him some time, but he does eventually relent, giving you the honor of winning this bout. Nice, nice. Definitely gonna suplex him. <laughs> Just ha, bam. Yeah, that's how. That's how you guys say hello. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I suplex him and then help him up afterwards. <laughs> it's like. And it is like, sure. it's that cool guy handshake where you like clasps your hand and clenches it tight. <laughs> um, everybody is cheering um, at the excitement of this battle. And it seems Baruth has indeed won this fighting tournament. This contest of Gorum. Nice. Yeah. Very excited. I'm I'm so happy that Baruth won. Actually, it was it was fun not knowing whether or not he was one, but it's also fun that we get to do this little bit. And hope you guys enjoyed that. <laughs> yeah, I just wanted to deal with that, and now I can now I can figure out where Baruth is. Um, I mean, would Baruth have gone with Koyal to the observatory? I don't I don't know. I mean, I I think so because if Koyal was there um, at the fighting tournament, then why wouldn't Baruth? go with her to the to the uh, observatory like I think that was the plan um, I would assume that you know those guys attacked while Bruce wasn't there <laughs> yeah no I, I he might have he might have gone with her to the town but he I don't know if he was interested enough to actually go into the observatory he's like no I mean if Ruth has like a cool championship belt I mean he's probably just walking around town <laughs> fair enough <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, then we will deal with that in the next session. Uh, NPC Baruth is randomly roaming around Sinishari. Yeah. yeah, you got he's, he's, he's become the cream of the crop, you know what I mean? Like, so, <laughs> he's got the world, the world championship belts. Yeah. All right, well, now that that's dealt with, everything is up to date in the, in the Fate Seer universe. <laughs> I should probably play that character again. <laughs> it might be a good time if he's going to show up to jump back into the story, but we'll see. We'll yeah. see. I actually, um, those characters, I did use a bunch of them in the uh, Crown of Dragons campaign um, in 2020. So. Nice. I, I, I just grabbed, I went through my session notes and I was like, what, what other people have I had that are good fighters? So... This was also for me, in a, in a way. Nice, nice. Um, yeah. All right, well, I guess everything's caught up. Actually, actually, um, Renkond, just because I'm looking at it now, Renkond was one of the guys that got, uh, that was almost killed by the Wyvern Kaibanth for more power. Oh, really? Wow, what a story <laughs> that guy went through. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> and he also arm-wrestled... Um, Edgar, one of the the fighter part, the fighter who was like a member of the Crown of Dragons party, so he's been through. Uh, he's seen people and done things. Wow, he's getting catching a lot of L's, man. He's kind of getting famous <laughs> being the, like an NPC now. <laughs> you should flesh that guy out more. <laughs> Apparently, <laughs> Rencon just keeps showing up. He keeps getting involved with the story. It's like an NPC. I love it. It's kind of one of the fun parts about having like your own living world. You can just decide which NPC is important and just keep reusing them. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, man. Um, secret second tip. <laughs> keep a cache of NPCs. 
Yeah, keep them in your back pocket. And when you're like, the party's kind of down, just have Redcon show up. <laughs> be like, oh, cool, it's Redcon. <laughs> yeah, man. <laughs> Everybody loves Redcon. Everybody loves Redcon. <laughs> um, yeah. All right. Well, that was uh, that was the recap of Quest of the Fates here. Uh, very excited to get back to that. Uh, the party has some more information about what the cult is up to. Uh, perhaps they can pursue them, and maybe they can save Prima before Vandrovo catches up with them. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm rooting for you guys. So if Calvin doesn't kill you, then yeah, <laughs> I'll try. <laughs> All right, folks, um, if you guys want to hear any more about other Pathfinder games or Lancer games, or if you're into Pathfinder 2E, uh, we have a bunch of stuff on the channel you might be interested in. Uh, the last couple episodes covered some Gen Con news, as well as some Starfinder 2E information, including a recap of a Starfinder 2E uh, field test that we did a while ago. So definitely go check all that stuff out. Um, and again, if you're into Lancer, uh, if you scroll down, there's a whole bunch of links to a whole bunch of third-party Lancer stuff. So go check all those, check out all those cool settings and adventures and books. Um, if you're into tabletop RPGs, uh, then I would recommend you check the Untold Stories Project channel, where I'm at on. Oh no, I can't say on Tuesdays and Wednesdays because <laughs> we just had the finale for Gem Stars, uh, featuring a crossover with the Freedom League Dark. Uh, so go check out that crossover. A lot of stuff happened. Um, <laughs> We, uh, we may have accidentally... <laughs> uh, it's the, the actual rulebook of the game came up in this session, and a random page got destroyed. Uh, and oh. there, there were consequences. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> we took the fourth wall, and we kind of just punched right through it. Uh, which is a very interesting thing to do in a tabletop RPG session, so go check that out. It was a whole lot of fun. Um, you guys push, pushing all sorts of boundaries over there in that channel. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's, it, it got really weird, but I, um, I'm really happy with it. Nice. I'm, I'm, I'm really happy with how everything, uh, how, how just how the session went. Just because it was so unexpected. But yeah, uh, go check that out. Um, also check out the gaming streams that are going on on the channel. Uh, just finished Dead Space 2, so by the time you're hearing this, I will have started Dead Space 3. Um... So yeah, check that out, and I think that's about it. Ramada, anything else you want to say before we head off? Uh, no, I think we're good to go. All right. Well, for all of our street fighting GMs and players out there, just remember to keep on winning with dice, and we'll see you next time. Bye, guys.